welcome everybody back to the X colloquium after uh, an absence of uh, 12 months, almost exactly. And uh, uh, we have uh, a terrific program uh, set up for the rest of uh, spring. And so uh, keep uh, looking out for those announcements. And uh, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Ron Fearing, who's going to introduce the speaker. Great. Well, welcome to the colloquium. And uh, thank you very much, Mark, for uh, agreeing to talk. It's great great to have you here. Uh, well, I've known, known Mark for a long time, uh, probably over, over 30 years. He got his uh, PhD at Stanford with Jean-Claude Thum with this very, uh, very cool uh, modular robot called uh, Polypod, which is just one of the really uh, pioneering reconfigurable robots. And I think uh, the, the, the theme has continued through his work of all these really cool robots that they don't have to stay the same way as they are when they're when they're first put together they'll, they'll end up end up doing something different or looking looking different afterwards uh, he's currently uh, or it's been at been at UPenn since about uh, 2004 if I remember right and he's now the director of the grasp lab and just doing uh, amazing things with the the mod lab and electromechanics and robotics and really thrilled to uh, have him here so wel welcome Mark Thanks, Ron. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric and Eli, for uh, inviting me. It's uh, nice to be able to do this. Actually, I, I uh, like the op I mean, I really appreciate the opportunity to give a talk as well. One of the things that um, I thought I'd do this time that's you know a little bit different than I, I've done in the past. Usually, you know, I do presentations where you talk about previous work and and things like that. And this time, I mean, I'm going to talk about things that are previous work and and, and published works, but having the opportunity to just talk to people um, and talk about uh, things that are not peer reviewed, uh, some wacky ideas that uh, may be interesting or not. Um, that's part of what I'm thinking about doing, throwing, throwing out a couple ideas for things that are not published, um, but hopefully will generate some thought and, and hopefully it looks like we have a lot of time for discussion. So it'd be great to see, um, to have the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, things as well. Um, so, Let's can I say, hopefully this is the right. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the kinematics, a kinematic versatility in robotics. Um, but before I do that, uh, I, I, Ron mentioned I am the director of the Grasp Lab, and so I, um, as the director, I think it's part of my job is to let people know about what Grasp Lab is uh, and the nice thing about the Grasp Lab with respect to Berkeley is that it was founded by your own uh, Rujin Abaishi um, in 1979. So it's over 40 years old and is the longest running robotics research lab in the country. This is what we like to claim. Some people think that uh, they're older, but um, we, we have been around, we believe we are um, the longest running uh, robotics research lab in the country, which is, it probably means in the world as well. Um, we have a lot of about 20 professors all doing robotics mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, um, working together a wide variety of different topics, as you can see here. Um, and one of the really nice things that I think uh, Professor Baichi established was a culture. So a culture in the lab where uh, people um, interact in the very interdisciplinary uh, fields, of, that is robotics. Um, uh, in, in a way that you know that our my students are constantly working with others. The, you you you're we're in this big space. They eat together. They work together. They see what other people are doing, whether it's machine learning or machine vision or, or building some robot or doing some experimentation. Um, and so uh, that type of thing makes it a really great place to work. Um, and I, I want to give you a little example. Um, one of my students, uh, Bruno Gabrich, uh, was happy to talk to uh, one of Vijay Kumar's students. Uh, David Sajanya, who VJ was doing kind of flying robots at the time. And, you know, I had this doing the self reconfiguring robots, robots that kind of rearranged themselves. And they, they were saying, well, why don't we have flying robots that, you know, rearrange themselves, like dock in midair and, and, and change their shape in midair. And I'm like, wow, that's a crazy idea. That's hard. It's <laughs> really hard. And, and, and why would you do that? Why, why would you want to have, I mean, sure, it's cool. But um, you know, in engineering, usually you want to have a good reason for doing these things, and they came up with this idea of, well, you know, maybe it could form a 
uh, bridge and from a burning building so people can get out and cross from one building to another. Um, but that's, uh, you know, I thought, okay, it's, it's a bit of a stretch, um, but uh, uh, we can, we can, you know, think about it. And, and eventually they, they actually, they did it. So um, uh, they, they got these things to dock in midair and, um, and it's hard because, you know, the control changes, it, you have to change the control parameters right after they dock, otherwise they fall into the sky and, and it's kind of, and it's really difficult. Um, it turns out that there are some uh, aerospace folks that are actually interested in doing something like this. Uh, not in this particular case, like we have, but if they have aerodynamic surfaces in which you can, uh, it might be beneficial to have a fixed wing flight flyer change its wing shape because you can do this, then, you know, there may be reasons. So ultimately, basically what, what we're talking about here is again, if you have a flyer that can change its shape, there may be some versatility that you can get out of it. The, the, fly, the flyer can change its shape to, to adapt to some uh, different way of doing things. Okay, so that leads to ultimately what I want to talk about. I was thinking about changing the, the title of this talk to be the most versatile robot in the world. Um, that's what I want to do. Uh, and um, but I, I thought maybe that's you know too pretentious, or, or I don't even know if it, that's really. Well, it's not necessarily a good idea because one of the questions is what does versatility mean uh, in robotics, and and so that's part of what we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes. Um, uh, and this is kind of the outline. We'll talk about the uh, what is versatility. Talk a little bit about modular reconfigurable robots with respect to versatility. And then most of the talk will focus on uh, this variable topology truss, which is um, uh, the most recent modular reconfigurable robot architecture that we've been working on. And then hopefully we'll have a, a lot of time for interesting, this interesting discussion. So um, hopefully I uh, hope to provoke some interesting thoughts and um, we, can, we can talk about things as we go. Okay, so uh, it's useful to look at history a little bit first, and in this case, just industrial robots. So the very first uh, industrial robot arms is like, you know, the, the, the Unimate, the Puma, there's the Stanford arm. Um, actually, I think uh, uh, Ron may have even been around um, as they were, at Stanford and I were, you know, we were, they were those, those robot arms were, were around Stanford when, we, when um, as we were there, we, at least we could, we could see the original ones, which is kind of cool to see. But in any case, um, the industrial arms started hitting the market uh, in the 70s. In the 80s, um, they uh, started the, the, you know, GM, IBM, all the big companies started to invest into uh, robot arms. Their vision was that there would be like this factory of the future, all these robots would build stuff. Um, one of the ideas that they had was that as the line changed, as the products changed, they could save money by reprogramming the robots to make the new thing. And that was probably one of their mistakes. Um, what they realized is that the cost of reprogramming a robot, the cost of just setting it up, the software part, the, the work cells, the, uh, making things work for a particular thing, um, customizing it to make something was expensive, uh, more expensive than the hardware. Um, and so in the 90s, all of the big com all the big companies, G GM, IBM, Cincinnati, Millicron, the, um, they were either bought out, sold to other areas, or just the robotics in, in general really had a decline. Um, and basically what they realized was that fixed automation uh, was much better than flexible automation. Fixed automation where it's just making, you make this thing to make one thing. It's faster, cheaper, uh, performed better, did things more precisely. Um, and so that, that was the move. More recently, there's been a resurgence in robotics. Um, and that's, I think, in large part because the software is better, the hardware is better in terms of being able to more easily program them. They're, they're capable to do more things because they're more, they're, uh, they're, uh, the hardware is better and the software um, is, is better as well. So again, it's versatility. So the story here is um, what can we do with versatility um, and well, then that begs the question, what is versatility, um, especially in the context of robotics? So with uh, versatility, usually you want to think about tasks. Can the robot do multiple tasks? Um, 
when you need the robot to do different things, how many different things can it do? Robot tasks are usually uh, broken down into two areas. There's, you know, uh, manipulation, can you move something around, um, locomotion, usually it's just two, manipulation and locomotion, and they're actually duals of each other, or, or some combination of uh, mobile manipulation or, or, or something like that. And you can kind of break those down into um, applying forces in different locations. So to pick up an object, you have to apply force to the object and apply force to make it move somewhere else. Um, in locomotion, you apply forces with your feet onto the environment in order to move. And basically, it's that's ultimately what you're doing, applying forces in different locations. Um, so the that application of forces then also has different parameters. When you think about the, what's required for a specific task, can you do a task? Do you have enough force to move those objects or not to move yourself or whatever it is? Can you move it precisely enough? Can you move it fast enough? Um, there, there's those types of constraints which will say whether a robot can or can't do something. And then there are other constraints like power, how much power um, does it have to carry its own batteries? Uh, how heavy can the robot be? How much does it cost? These types of constraints also exist that kind of constrain whether uh, a robot system will work for um, uh, a particular task or not. Um, so if we, let's look at a couple examples. Uh, you might have, uh, and, you know, the Amazon uh, Kiva uh, mobile robots that do fulfillment, fulfillment. So little mobile robots that drive around, pick up shelves, and, and move around. You could have uh, robot arms that, you know, classical thing is pick in place, um, putting chocolates into boxes or packaging or something like that. Some type of robot assembly. Maybe you have some specialized end effector like welding or painting, or a surgical robot that you know, does something super precise inside of a body, or maybe it's really tiny. Um, so uh, the, the, kind of that spans a lot of the uh, range of, of the types of um, robotic, physical robotic uh, elements that, that are there. So if, if we wanted to think about what is the most versatile robot, we would need to come up with a metric, a metric for versatility. And some of the components for a performance metric might include the payload, so you want to maximize the payload, so how much force you can do, how precise, how fast. Um, if you're a, a mobile robot, then the terrain, can you? does it need to fly? Does it need to go in the water or under the water? Um, uh, or for robot arms, it's range of motion is the typical thing. Um, how, what's its workspace? How far do you need to reach? Do you need to reach up to a sh the top shelf on the kitchen or um, you know that kind of thing? And then there's the degrees of freedom. So, um, so there are some tasks which need like two-handed manipulation. You need to pick up a large box, uh, or you know, if you're playing the piano and you have to play chords, then you have to press like five different things at the same time. You know, they're, they're, whatever it is, there are there may be all these different types of constraints for um, that imply uh, the number of degrees of freedom that you have. This last thing is is um, Another uh, performance metric that I think could be important is what I call speed of reconfiguration. So in, in this, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I'm going to focus now on just the bottom three. Um, so assuming that the other ones are things that people can talk about later, but um, for the robot that I'm going to talk about, the, uh, this uh, um, variable topology truss, uh, range of motion, degrees of freedom, and speed of reconfiguration, so speed of reconfiguration basically comes from the idea that you know you can reconfigure things. If you need to do two different things, you typically don't need to do them at the same time. So you can reconfigure them. And, and in the worst case, you have a robot, you could take it apart and then rebuild it to do that other thing if you needed to do a different task. That would take you know days or, or weeks or however long it took to take the thing apart and rebuild it to do the different task. Or if you have a robot that's designed to be reconfigured, like uh, uh, Legos, you know, it's a great example. You, you take them apart, you put them together, you, you know, it can, it can be much faster than um, disassembling and reassembling a, a thing that's not made to be taken apart. Um, or you can be, you know, like a transformer, um, uh, the toys that, you know, robots in disguise, uh, it's self reconfigured. So that can be much faster. And that's ultimately what we want to look at. So in terms of um, versatility, the speed of reconfiguration, I think, is an important performance metric as well. What are the weightings for all these different things? I don't know, but ultimately that's 
what I think are the components that you might want to have for versatility. And, and this is one of the things that I think if you're interested in talking about this in a discussion, I'd, I'd love to hear what you what you are thinking. Um, these are just ideas that I've recently started thinking about. Uh, so when we talk about things like the transformers, things that can reconfigure, it's kind of useful to look at some history. Um, so these are, uh, uh, this robot is an example from uh, 2007, it's a long time ago, it's like a little robot that's walking. Uh, my student's going to kick it and it's going to fall apart and then the, the robot will put itself back together again. An important part of self-reconfiguring is the ability to reattach. Um, so the attachment mechanism is um, one of the most important parts. Um, and so this video is about one of the uh, docking mechanisms we call uh, the electro-permanent uh, EP face, which is made of electro-permanent magnets. More recently, we've been focusing on um, the higher level aspects of self-reconfiguring robots, which is things like, uh, can the robot know what to do autonomously? How does it know what shape to be or how to use that shape to do different things? So um, we are starting to look at at uh, doing things, uh, um, in this case, you know, autonomously. Um, in the, uh, the video up here, uh, these are little smart cameras. So back in 2007, actually, it wasn't that, that common to have uh, smart cameras, but they're uh, smart cameras in these um, cubes and the, the robots are searching for each other. Um, they, they know that they've been taken apart. And so uh, they'll, they'll eventually, um, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, come together and, and dock. Um, and then ultimately they'll, they'll again try to stand up again. Um, so a couple things about this video though, uh, it took like 50 trials for my students um, to get this thing to actually work. It was not robust. Um, uh, you know, it, it would get close. So it, it is, you know, doing everything autonomously. The, the cameras are communicating to each other with the, the blinking red lights. Um, and then uh, they attach together magnetically um, and it stands up and uh, it's supposed to then, you know, start walking again. And um, there's a small bump in the floor and uh, it gets stuck and, and just falls over, um, which was kind of appropriate, um, funnily appropriate, just because, you know, it was classic in terms of, you know, you, you try really hard and then at the end it just falls over. Um, so, which, which brings me to um, some of the things that I, I call the myths about modular reconfigurable systems. One of the things that we often say, and I've said before, um, you know, if you have a versatile modular robot system, and for some reason you have a task where you need to have a larger workspace, you need to reach up to a shelf when you can't, and you just add more modules. It makes the robot system bigger, it has a larger workspace, but that's kind of a myth because, um, there are issues with, with increasing the, the number of modules. Um, things get more interesting as you add more degrees of freedom. That's also interesting. Yeah, that's true. Things do get more interesting. Um, here is a, an example of a system with 56 degrees of freedom. It's uh, 56 one degree of freedom modules, little um, mostly RC servos, essentially. This turns out to be the largest number of um, degrees of freedom in a single modular reconfigurable robot system yet, as far as I know. Um, you know, people have been doing modular reconfigurable robots for uh, at least 25 years. You know, it's like a quarter century. There are hundreds of groups doing this type of thing. And 56 is the, is the largest number, which seems small. And this was done in 2003. So this is almost 20 years ago. Um, and why is that? Uh, so there was robot systems like Kilobots, which had a thousand robots. Um, but they were not rigidly attached together. It's more like a swarm robot. So robots which are rigidly attached, um, I, I haven't seen, maybe I'm wrong and I, I just haven't found one, but I haven't seen ones that are, are more than like 50 degrees of freedom, um, which is a lot, but you'd think that, um, you know, for when people talk about scaling up systems after 25 years, you'd have more than 56, because this is the type of thing that, especially the computer science folks are really interested in seeing is, you know, what if you have hundreds, thousands, millions of, of about modules and coming up with ways of programming them. Um, the other big myth is that you get ro robustness from redundancy. And, and this is essentially, um, our experience has been, you know, 
the more modules you have, the worse it is, the more likely things will fail. Um, and they fail a lot. Um, and it could be because these are experimental systems. These are not, you know, industrial uh, things that are mature that have been around a long time and then super robust. Um, they're just, you know, students put them together and then you make a hundred of them with the, each one's probability of failing is, is higher. So maybe that's what it is. Uh, but in any case, one of the things that I, I, I've taken away from this in terms of uh, modular reconfigurable systems, if you want to have things that have a larger workspace, it's better to have uh, a robot that can um, change its size rather than adding modules. So this is this is a variable topology trust, and this is the type of architecture that I think so far is the most promising in the modular reconfigurable robot space. So this is a, an animation um, made by um, our partners at uh, Seoul National University for um, what we call a variable topology truss. It's like a variable geometry truss in which the elements can change their length. But in this case, the topology can change as well. The node connectivity can change the member, the truss member arrangement. Um, so that's what's happening here. The, the robot is changing its topology so that it can change its architecture to do things um, like form a system that can reach up taller. In this particular case, it's for search and rescue and what we call a, a shoring application. I'll have a little bit more detail about that in the future slide. Um, so a little bit more background on trusses. So, you know, trusses are uh, all over the place um, in, in cranes and bridges and buildings. And, and there's a reason why, and that's because they are much more materially efficient when you want to build something, um, a structure, you make it a truss because you only need to have the, the bar elements. It doesn't have to be solid. It's a much more efficient way to do things. So um, back in 1997, uh, Art Sanderson and Greg, his student Greg Hanlon put to, had this idea they called Tetrobot, which is basically um, a truss with prismatic members. Um, and in order to make that work, they had to do a bunch of things which we'll get into. One of the reasons why didn't really catch on in the, I think the robotics research community uh, is because the member length extension ratio, these are just the typical prismatic joints which have you know, one to two at best. Um, but uh, so it didn't really do that much um, and all the, the, topo the topology was fixed. So you, you uh, couldn't really change it very easily. Um, there are, uh, there are other people that have done similar things um, like uh, these are all actually tetrahedrons, but uh, tetrahedron is basically a truss um, and where you can change the member lengths uh, to do different things and like walking around. This is a this one's kind of interesting because it has a large expansion ratio and you can kind of see what you can do with it. They are made of these are actually tape measures, measuring tape in, in here. They're pretty clever. Um, but being a measuring tape also means that it's really weak. I can't support any load at all. Uh, but ultimately, this is the thing that got me most excited about this type of idea where you have um, a truss elements that can change. Uh, so this is from NASA Goddard. Um, you know, if you have a robot that can go to Mars and, and start out really tiny, which is really useful for going on a rocket ship because you know you don't have space. It's super expensive to, to send anything in, in space. And it can do things like chimney up uh, between a, a cliff or something um, and then tumble around. And if it comes up to a, a gap, it can form a bridge uh, by reaching across. Um, you know, that would, that's all like super versatile. Um, part of it's enabled because it, it can have this really long reach. It actually hasn't changed its topology but um, it's able to do a lot of different things. So one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that we got excited by that particular thing, we, we think we can improve on the previous Tetrobot is we had this idea for what we call the spiral zipper, which is basically a prismatic joint. Um, the prismatic joint is basically a tube that zippers on itself. So the top edge zippers to the bottom edge and um, that allows you to form a, uh, a tube. Um, and so you can start really small because you're kind of like wound up like a, uh, like a paper towel and then 
um, you know, form a helix to, to grow really tall. Uh, the other really nice thing about um, the, uh, this particular form is that the uh, tube is very, very efficient in terms of strength to rate ratio under compression. If you mount it on a, a universal joint, then also you essentially have a simple uh, um, robot arm, essentially. So trusses in general um, have different properties. Uh, like, the, like I said earlier, uh, tetrahedron is the smallest truss you can have. Um, the structures need to be statically determinate. Um, and and you, you get that by um, putting at the nodes uh, spherical joints, essentially. You want the, there to be no constraints at the nodes. Um, and if you look at bridges, uh, you know, the many bridges will have an element. They're not actually into the ground. They'll, they'll actually be a pin joint where you might think the bridge is actually attached to the ground. And the pin joint gives this extra degree of freedom in order for the bridge to be uh, statically determinant. Uh, so that when things like the length stretch because of heat or, or, or change the length, um, you don't get internal stresses um, and, and uh, the bridge will damage itself. Um, same thing in, in our case where we've got uh, trusses where one of the members may change the size. If it's statically determinate, then the uh, joint will allow it to move freely, um, but in a constrained way. Uh, if, if you didn't have these joints, if they were actually actuated, and not free joints, then you might end up fighting. It'll be over constrained. You might end up fighting each other. Also, it can't be under constrained. If we didn't have this member here, then these these two elements would just flop around. You wouldn't be able to control it. It'd be uncontrollable. So it has to be statically determinate. And determining, getting, finding out whether we have a statically determinate system is all not exactly trivial. Um, uh, one way to guarantee it is if every time you add a node, you just add three members. That's one way to, to, by construction, guarantee that a, a system that you have in terms of a truss is statically determined. Um, so some guiding principles for our um, variable topology truss robot system are listed here. We, we want the truss members to have a high expansion ratio. Um, so we're gonna use a spider zipper. Uh, the truss nodes, um, will have spherical joints, so that they, they have no moments. We want them to be chainable. Um, so that means that the at the node, we want don't want it to be fixed to three members or four members or five. We want to be able to change the number of members attached at that node. So um, we can do that by being chainable. And we want to do things simply. So this is actually stuff that was also written by um, Sanderson and, and Hamlin um, in one of their early Applications. So what do we mean by spherical joint? Um, this is uh, an animation of that. So basically a spherical joint is a, a linkage. So this is one example of, of a linkage uh, where the members essentially always point, they're constrained in space, but are free to rotate, but, and they always point to the center of the node. Um, one of the issues here is that this particular linkage um, may collide with other ones as they move around. Um, which can be a little bit tricky. The uh, other thing is we want the system to be chainable or extendable. And so this is what we mean by that. The members can attach or detach from one end of the chain. So when this guy atta is attached here, it has another opening that another member can then attach into it. So you form a chain and that way, this is why you can have an arbitrary number of members at a node up to the space before it, it, it um, there's just no more space. Okay, so um, if you look back at that video from, from NASA, um, it, doing that, what they actually had, I think is nearly impossible. Uh, and because of some physical constraints and one software constraint, but the two physical constraints are um, the expansion ratio. Um, in this particular case, this was the smallest it was, and then it, you know, grew to something bigger. And this isn't even the biggest that they had in that video, but you know, it's probably like 100 to one or more than 100 to one, um, which is hard to do. You just, you know, having that much material that collapses down um, is difficult. Another thing that I think is maybe more difficult that we found in terms of trying to de design these things is 
the angle at the node, the minimum angle. So here, when it forms a sharp uh, corner, the angle between the nodes gets really tight and designing a mechanism that can fit there without colliding is hard. Uh, and then the software thing is um, motion planning and collision detection. We, they have more than 18 members here. Um, are they, this is probably colliding with each other. And, and as they move, did they do the collision checking? I, I kind of doubt they did, but just doing that motion is difficult. I'm not going to talk too much about that um, uh, in this talk. I, there are references. We've got some publications on this if you're interested in, in how to address that. Um, so our system, we were able to get, I think it's 20 degrees. Um, I'm not positive I, that's exactly right. Uh, we did get, uh, we had a ratio, expansion ratio of like 45 to 1, um, uh, which is, you know, you can see it's actually quite large. Um, the application ultimately that we wanted to do was this shoring for search and rescue. The idea is when it, uh, when there's like a earthquake or something like that, where there are multiple buildings that are damaged, normally first responders build these wooden structures as they go and uh, into a building so that the, the building doesn't collapse on them as they try to search or, or rescue people. Uh, so our idea was that this VTT could be that shoring structure which means that it would have to support a thousand pounds according to the standard um, uh, engineering documents, which is actually quite heavy, but it turns out that we can, we can do that um, because the tube is essentially the optimal strength to weight ratio shape for under compression. Um, and we did use plastic bands, but um, if you use the steel bands, you can get a lot stronger um, uh, systems. So the, the interesting thing um, that besides the expansion ratio um, versatility is the reconfigurability. Um, and this is the one aspect that we didn't get too far with with the current system. Uh, so how do we do reconfiguration? Um, essentially, the idea is, actually maybe it's easier to do. Let's say we start with this cube uh, six-sided structure, and we want to end up with this five-sided triangular prism, the way we do that um, is we do what's called what we call merging and splitting. So these two nodes merge together um, oops, into here, oops, into this spot, and then split in a different way that they were attached. Um, and once they, once they split, they can, you know, form this different shape. So this actually, this video shows that. Uh, the nodes are splitting and then they come together and detach in a different way. I can show that again here. Um, the, this node up here will split and then actually go underneath this bar, which could be convenient. This one will actually join and split in different ways. So that's ultimately how we do reconfiguration. And by doing se sequences of those, you can go between a lot of different um, configurations. So here is kind of a stop motion uh, video of uh, our hardware and how that happens. Um, uh, here's Alexander demonstrating the actual latching mechanisms um, for uh, how, how that type of uh, reconfiguration will occur. We didn't actually do this fully autonomously. Um, with the system, but uh, the capability is there. So one of the tools that we found to be really useful um, is what we call a topology neighbor graph. So this particular topology for a given number of members is shown here. And if it does a reconfiguration, for example, if two nodes dock together, that would move to a different configuration um, which would be a different dot. So this graph shows different configurations. And then if it's split into a different way, there are these a dozen or so different ways that it could split and merging again and splitting again. And ultimately you, you, you form all the different possibilities and you get you know, hundreds or thousands of different configurations depending on how many members you have. Uh, so in this particular, this uh, is some of the those um, configurations extracted out for different potentially useful configurations. And 
Um, Alexander spent a long time figuring out, looking at the different configurations. So here's one that we call the ceiling shore because it can be tall and have a flat base at the bottom and a flat base at the top. This could be something like a tent. You could have you know people inside a, a space underneath. Here's a cube. Um, this is what we call the wall shore. If you have a wall that you need to keep from falling down, there, there's a flat part on this side. Um, so it could fit between a wall and the floor. This is a very compact one. This configuration is also a 21 member uh, truss, but it is something that has four elements that could be like legs. So we call it the quadruped because it could kind of theoretically walk. If we look at the topology neighbor graph, all of these guys, so this is the ceiling shore. Um, if we have the two nodes docked together, it would go here and then we split, we end up with a cube. This is the reconfiguration example I showed a couple of slides ago. The quadruped configuration is not attached to this topology neighbor graph. So it cannot reconfigure from these all can reconfigure between themselves by following these paths through, through this topology neighbor graph. But this is not in the connected component. So we cannot do that. And so that's, I mean, this is one of the examples that are I mean, just an example of, of a useful way of a tool for examining the topologies um, and doing uh, kind of reconfiguration planning. How do you decide what to do and how to do it and, and where to go? So this is the latest um, uh, that uh, students were able to do. Um, you know, uh, a year ago, uh, COVID hit and everyone had to, to leave the lab. Um, so we were able to just recently get back in the lab and um, what we're trying to do here is uh, tumble. So do like a, a, a gate a walk. Um, what's happening here is, you know, it's kind of oscillating back and forth. Part of the reason for that is we're doing things using the Vicon system for uh, the motion of each one of these black balls. You can see the little Vicon markers there. So we're doing closed loop control of the position um, and, you know, for a variety of errors and um, uncontrolled degrees of freedom and, and things like that. Uh, uh, it, it, it's um, doing a little bit of wobbling back and forth, but essentially it's now shifting its center of gravity so that it can lift up this bottom guy. And then ultimately, we, this is how we do locomotion. Uh, we currently have actually a really cool uh, simulation for doing um, locomotion. Imagine you have a robot like this and it wanted to climb under a table. Uh, because we have these uh, trust members, these, uh, which are these spiral zippers, they could shrink and essentially make the robot smaller as it moves. Uh, and so it could climb under a table. And then if it wanted to climb over a fence or something, it could expand and grow really big. And, um, and so you know, that's, that's uh, uh, an example that we haven't published yet, but we are about, we've just submitted, which should be fine. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of where we are now. Um, but what I'd like to do is talk about where we'd like to go and this thing that I call, um, you know, the most versatile system in the world, if we want to talk about kinematic versatility. So uh, this is the next version of the, um, the variable topology trust system is rather than being focusing on strength, like the previous one, which had to hold up a building, uh, I think we want to focus on reconfiguration because we were not really able to do a good job with reconfiguration with that previous design. So here, the idea is that, okay, so also previously, one of the things with this is, you know, when the nodes merge, you may have noticed we can't do that with this guy. Well, once we, we don't have enough members to, to do reconfiguration, um, there's a minimum number, but also there's these, these spheres are there and they're in the way. You can't merge nodes when there are these black spheres in the way. And so part of our idea in this particular case was that we would drop them. We would drop a sphere when we wanted to merge and then merge together. And then if we need to pick it up, we pick it up again. How we do that uh, is not necessarily clear and not easy either, but that was kind of what we were thinking at the time. So the new design, rather than being, uh, in this case, I, I call it member centric because all the mechanism is in the spiral zipper. These are just hollow spheres, nothing's on the inside. Um, 
the, the node trust elements are outside, the um, spiral zipper motors are outside, everything's outside. This new design would have everything in the spheres. So motors would be in the spheres. The only thing on the outside would be the spiral zipper without a motor. Um, so uh, it's a bit tricky, but we think if we do that, um, a lot of the reconfiguration um, elements would become much easier. Uh, so uh, the mechanism to get the spiral zipper to work would be magnetically coupled to the motor that's inside the sphere. Um, so you have a magnetic transmission. Uh, we could get an eight to one expansion, extension compression ratio, which is essentially looks like this when the two nodes, including the size of the nodes when it's fully compressed um, to, to uh, fully extended. We'd get, uh, we get the 20 degree minimum angle. Um, the interesting thing is that the design is limited by current, current analysis is by the friction in the bearings, not by the magnetic strength. It turns out that you can get magnets and magnet transmissions that are really strong um, and uh, strong enough to, to hold the system together as you dock and, and things like that, um, which is kind of interesting. So um, if you have a system like that, then we can do something that we call a, a meta module. Uh, so if, here's the meta module is basically like a subgroup. So here's a, a tetrahedral meta module sub element. Um, and this is essentially a grouping that can move around by itself. Um, and if you have two of them, they can come together, dock together and form a cube. The thing that's in these meta modules that's also different is that it's not just a tetrahedron, but there are these other elements that are sticking out. And we actually need that in order to do this type of docking. Um, but we think we can. You have this extra element that's, again, it's not exactly a truss anymore because you have these guys that are um, rigidly attached. Uh, and and um, essentially, you could you know, get meta modules and, and modules of meta modules or multiple of them to come together and form large shapes and start to have a larger system that can. Uh, have lots of degrees of freedom and um, move around and, and do interesting things or split apart if it needs to. Um, uh, so ultimately, I think this would be, okay, so when I say we don't look at the speed, we don't look at the uh, maximum force, we don't look at precision, we only look at number of degrees of freedom and the range of motion. That's what I call kinematically versatile. So um, do we have the most kinematically versatile robot. One of the things when you think about range of motion is that it comes at the cost of the size of the robot. If you want a large range of motion, you have a large robot, almost by definition. But in our case, the robot, um, because the, it collapses, the, side, the minimum size of the robot can be much smaller than the range of motion, the largest maximum range of motion. And that ratio, I think, is the thing that one of the things that you would want to maximize. Um, the other thing is degrees of freedom. So uh, usually when you think about degrees of freedom, the bad thing is it's expensive. Um, the more motors you have, the more, more costs, uh, and that, and the more complex it is and all those other kinds of things. And sometimes you cannot get away from minimizing the numbers of degrees of freedom depending on the task that you have. In our case, one of the things that we're trying to do, and we think we can make this low cost because um, we are, one of the things we're doing is we think we can exploit um, the things like, um, you know, roller skate bearings, like the fidget spinners, they all use these uh, skate bearings. So they're super cheap. You can get like a hundred of them for a couple of dollars um, and they're, they're not bad. We think we can use those bearings um, along with um, these uh, ball transfer bearings that it, now that people are doing a lot of these packaging um, uh, systems, you can get these ball transfer bearings that are, are also really cheap. Um, you know, by doing that type of thing, getting, uh, and, and like those spheres, there are these things called the garden mirror balls that people have in their gardens that are basically stainless steel spheres. We can use those, um, leverage the, uh, the consumer aspects of, of things that are out there um, to get things really low cost. And anyway, that's what we think we can do. We think we can get this um, reconfiguration to be fast, kind of. The thing that um, you know I always worry about is robustness, and that's an issue that I don't really have a good answer for. Hopefully someone out there does. Um, 
The one interesting thing is that with these types of systems, they are the hardware is really hard, the software is really hard. In many aspects, the software is often harder than the hardware problems. So sometimes if you can make the hardware, design the hardware to make the software easier, uh, that will end up better. Usually people design the hardware and then you know throw it to the software people and, and then they have to struggle with it. Um, so I'm just ending up here. Uh, this is the group from uh, Seoul National University um, who worked with us um, at Penn with this AFLSR contract, which is just ending. Um, we have a bunch of uh, students at, at Penn who worked on this. Actually, some of them I believe are here and maybe they can answer questions if we have, if we have some. Uh, I'll just leave this up for a second. If you have um, questions about publications or, or want to see some uh, other aspects of what we talked about, uh, they are listed here, including a lot of the um, planning for the, the software issues that I didn't get to. Um, the, the last thing is, uh, maybe I'll just show this video. These are like some of the bloopers of when things fall apart, uh, and, and, and uh, which are kind of fun. But um, I, well, as this is playing, I guess I can open it up for questions. We're five minutes before five. How should we do this? Great, thank you, Mark. Um, so I think, um, Ron, did you wanna handle the Q&A or uh, do you want Eli and I to handle that? Um. Well, sure. I guess uh, well, let's. Uh, I guess we can, uh, do some virtual uh, thank Mark for the great, uh, great, great talk, and uh, let's uh, start from the top with the uh, questions. I guess. Uh, uh, let's see. So, if, if folks uh, raise your hand, and then we can also unmute you, and you can ask your question live, so we can facilitate that. Um, well, if I don't see one there, maybe I could s start off. Is there, is there already a question there? I can't see on the list. Um, I unmuted Alexander. You can go okay. ahead, Alexander. I didn't have any particular questions. I don't know. Uh, did I accidentally raise my hand? <laughs> uh, could be. <laughs> OK, why don't you go ahead, Ron? Uh, so it's interesting to think about how you what, what's the maximum uh, extension. Um, there must is there something you could do with like just ultra thin wall tubes, and you could just like you know make a, a a nested set of twenty of them. I mean, is that I mean is the the limit ten or you know what is there a mathematical limit? Um, so I haven't. Uh, yeah, theoretically you could do like an, an, an antenna, you know, just nested yeah, tubes. Yeah. Usually what happens is. Um, you get slop between each one that you add, adds more slop, um, and it gets pretty bad. Uh, so theoretically, you can you can make it precise, but especially when when you get fully extended, the the joint that you have at, between the nested part is not very good. Um, that's is, it, is there some hybrid like tensegrity thing where you could have your telescoping antenna with a tension element in it to stabilize it? Um. Yeah. Maybe you could. The other problem with the um, nesting thing is that you don't get that type of compressive advantage. You need something else to push, to hold it because it, they just slide inside. You need something to push them out, right, and, and hold it, which I don't know how you do that. You could put like a balloon in it maybe and push it out, but then you might not just have a balloon. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, yeah, on the subject of uh, balloons, uh, there's a uh, professor at Harvard who uh, made everything with balloons and got them to move around. And uh, 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 it's a similar philosophy to what you're uh, talking about. Have you come across that? Um, there are, so there are, I'm uh, not familiar with the one at Harvard, but there are others that I know of that have done a, a variety of um, balloon-like um uh, Things there's most recently at Stanford, um, uh, Yusevich and uh, uh, Sean Fulmer and Max Schwager, um, they have this robot that's uh, inflated, but they they kink it, and you can kind of you know as the as a bend in the tube, um, you can kind of get that kink to change positions, but the the circumference 
of the tube remains constant, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, there, there are, uh, but so it's basically like a truss, which changes its lengths elements, but um, the the sum of the lengths must be constant. Right, uh, right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. So if you had everything you wanted in terms of uh, the joints and uh, the, all the flexibility, uh, what would it enable? Um, <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, this is kind of the question that I also gave to my student was like, you know, with the flying robots, like why? Um, and and in, in this particular case, um, we could have a robot that could do all kinds of things if it could also have enough force, be fast enough, be low cost enough, be robust enough, all these other issues which are not solved yet. So if we had all those other problems um, solved, then you could theoretically have a robot that uh, you know, could, like, at least for like for the search and rescue example, it can be small enough to, you know, fit in the trunk of your car. And then um, when you get to a, a site, expand out, walk around, um, be large enough to climb on top of a building or form a dome to protect people, you know, if you need to have a, a shelter um, or if it's strong enough, you know, it could form a landing pad for a helicopter or, you know it could, it could do all kinds of stuff if it was strong enough and um, fast enough and robust enough and all these other things but it's super super versatile that's kind of the uh, the idea so strength still matters well potentially um there are uh like if you're out in space where you don't have to worry about gravity then forming a mirror like a parabolic mirror that could be that could be really useful for a telescope uh, or um, maybe reaching out a long arm or expanding out a solar panel. You know, there's lots of different things in which you don't need strength, but you need the shape. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be useful. Um, also, like planetary exploration is another type of thing where versatility is really valuable. Rather than having 50 different robots, 50 different tools, you have one robot that can be those tools when you need them. Uh, so on that subject, uh, we, we have the Mars rover that's kind of like a robot, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's got uh, many of the features, but it basically looks, looks like a small car. Right. So I'll, I'll ask a question. A, the great talk, by the way, Mark. I, and Fuss, I love seeing robots in videos and better in real life. But uh, thank you for sharing some really great insights. I'm thinking um, actually of an application related to this, which is with kind of human robot interaction often you want compliance in various directions or when interacting with a person so i could imagine thinking of how they might reconfigure to give the compliance for the kind of human side and maybe more of the rigidity you'd want for an application space but i'm trying to think of th how these might situate themselves in kind of really in a home or in a healthcare facility or any kind of interaction with human is that also a application space that's been kind of thought about for this these designs um we haven't we've got a couple other projects in my lab that are looking at um interacting with people pushing them around and usually it's like with inflatables and, and that kind of thing because you like to have that passive compliance we could theoretically have an active compliance you have all these extra degrees of freedom and you could Theoretically, you know, if you sense things, you move it to, to comply as, as needed. But usually they're not, you know, they're not cost effective and they're not fast enough to, to make it actually work well from a HRI or haptic point of view. Yeah, but, but yeah. In, even in general, I know that the challenges of, you know, the realistic challenges of motors and gears and getting the kind of power in, inside of the systems, but in the general thinking is this could be a kind of programmable material because it could reshape it. So I know that's not the scale. It's a little hard to grasp, but when I look at it, I think, wow, just moving this down in scale, maybe it's in a MEMS technology. I don't know. It could be something really exciting. I know you're not there yet, but I love seeing the vision. I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah, um, we, we were part of uh, the, there was a programmable matter thing at DARPA a long time ago. And um, there are some, I'm pretty excited. Actually, we have another project on microscopic robots um, that I'm pretty excited by, but it's, 
Uh, right now, it's little little tiny uh, walkers, but they could theoretically walk around and then join together and form <laughs> bigger structures on the micro scale. But uh, yeah, it's an entirely different architecture. Um, but on the other point that you, you made that uh, actually would apply here is furniture. You know, having this could be, you know, you need a chair, it forms a chair. You, you As the little kid grows, the chair could get bigger. Um, you know, that kind of simple thing uh, could be applied here. Of course, this is an expensive way to have a chair, but um, the the idea is there. Well, now, what about the, the problem you mentioned at the beginning is that the uh, uh, the robots, the industrial robots uh, failed in the 90s when the companies realized that it cost uh, the hardware was flexible, but then it cost way too much to reprogram it. It seems like uh, what you've told us about still has that issue. Yes. Um, so, right. This is, we haven't, this is harder to program than most normal robots. Um, so uh, it's, it's usually when you have a robot system, you have the software, you come up with good software techniques to make the robot system do other useful things, but you can never do more than what the hardware limits you to be, to be able to do. So this is a, a way to allow more flexible hardware that can do a lot more, but you have to come up with better ways to program it. So given that we've got, you know, Moore's law and uh, software techniques are, are expanding faster and faster, you know, at an exponential rate, maybe even with machine learning, people are talking about all kinds of solutions for things. Maybe that's something that, you know, could be applied here and eventually we'll have the software solutions faster than, and that we'll be able to solve the problems that this hardware presents. So it's almost like you need an operating system before you can get a, a good robot. Yeah. Interesting how okay. you're putting it. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Let's see if our participants, if they can uh, raise their hands. And uh, Alex, Alexander, you're still at the top of the list, but it um, uh, doesn't look like uh, we have any more questions. Uh, so uh, what, I, what would happen now is we would take you out to dinner in normal circumstances, uh, but uh, uh, we'll have to uh, postpone that uh, for your next visit. Okay, and uh, so if there are no further questions, uh, let's uh, congratulate Mark and thank him again. Thanks. Thanks for allowing me, thanks for indulging me and in, in, uh, <laughs> allowing me to present here. It's thank great. You, thank you, Mark. Thank you. We love all the videos, yes.